Okay. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. So today we are welcoming two speakers, as usual, Rohit Veish uh, and then John Dickerson. So we start with Rohit. So Rohit Veish uh, uh, comes from the Tata Institute uh, for Fundamental Research in uh, Mumbai. Okay, please start. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, uh, okay, so thank you, Jerome, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I have uh, enjoyed listening to the talks in this seminar series, and uh, it's a real privilege to be speaking with you all today. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about stable fractional matchings. This is based on a paper that appears at EC 2019 and uh, will be appearing in the Artificial Intelligence Journal. This is based on joint work with Yanis Karajianis, Aris Pilos Ratsikas, and Panagiotis Kanelopoulos, and I believe all of whom are uh, on the call. So if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to post it in the chat, and uh, I'm sure at least one of us will get to it. Okay, so. Uh, this paper is about the stable matching problem, and I'm sure most of you are already familiar with it. So let me start with that. Uh, so the stable matching problem consists of two sets of agents, generally referred to as men and women, each of whom has a preference over the agents in the other set. Okay, so in this case, W1 thinks that M3 is better than M2 is better than M1. We see that a matching of men and women is stable if there is no blocking pair. What does that mean? Well, suppose we are given a matching like this. I see that this matching is not stable. Why? Because there is a pair of agents, M2 and W2, who each prefer, who prefer each other over their assigned partners. Okay, so such a pair tends to destabilize the matching. It's called a blocking pair and a stable matching is one that uh, disallows such pairs. Uh, thankfully, uh, from the seminal result of Gale and Shapley, we know that no matter what preferences we have, there always exists a stable matching. And not only that, such a matching can even be found in polynomial time. And indeed, in this instance, this you can verify that this is a stable matching. Now, stable matchings have lots and lots of applications. Uh, most prominently, they are used for matching medical residents with hospitals under the National Resident Matching Program in the US. Stable matching algorithms are also very widely used in matching school kids with uh, public or charter schools under the school choice program. It's very, it's very big in the US and also I believe in uh, other places. And stability or stable matching algorithms have also informed some of the early developments in the area of organ exchanges and specifically kidney exchange. Uh, and in fact, uh, the second speaker in today's session, John, has done a lot of exciting work in this area. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all, all aware that uh, the 2012 Nobel Prize in Economics uh, that was awarded to Al Roth and Lloyd Shapley, uh, it was awarded in largely for their contributions to these domains that I just mentioned. And from the Nobel Prize citation, you can tell that stable allocations and stability, they have played a central role in that. So it's a it's a fairly big deal. Okay, so what do we do? So we are looking at a generalization of the gale shapley model, which I'm going to call standard model. So the standard model uh, makes two important assumptions. It assumes that the matching between agents uh, is an integral matching in the sense that two agents are either completely matched or completely unmatched. It also assumes that agents have ordinal preferences, typically in the form of rankings. What we do is we consider the, a generalization of both of these assumptions. So instead of integral matchings, we are going to allow for fractional matchings, right? So uh, in, in the sense that now the matching weights can be anything between zero and one. And these make sense in uh, time sharing applications. So imagine there is a, a freelance worker who is thinking of splitting their time between different jobs instead of working for a single employer all the time. And obviously fractional matchings are a natural language for thinking about randomization. We also allow for uh, cardinal preferences. So instead of just having a ranking, 
uh, each agent's preference is going to be given by uh, numerical utilities or valuations. And these are a relevant model when we're thinking about wages in labor markets. So just to make things a little bit more concrete, uh, once again, we are going to have these two sets of agents, but now the preferences are given by numbers instead of just ranking. So in this picture, uh, M1's value for the woman W3 is two, for W2 is one, and for W1 is zero. And what we are seeking is a fractional matching. So a fractional matching is just an object that satisfies these equalities and inequalities uh, on the screen. And as an example, imagine a matching that puts a weight of 0 0.5 on each of the dashed edges. So this is a valid fractional matching because all the matching weights are non-negative and we end up matching one unit mass of every agent. We're going to assume that agents have additive utilities, which is to say that the utility of each agent is the sum of all the matching weights that it is part of scaled by its valuations. Okay, So for example, W1's utility in this case would be three times a half plus one times a half, which is two. And the key notion here is that of stability, which says that for any man-woman pair, either the utility of the man should be above his valuation of the woman, or the utility of the woman should be above her valuation for the man. At least one of these things must be true. In other words, for every pair, at least one agent must meet the requisite utility threshold. If you want to think of it in terms of a blocking pair, uh, we're going to say that a man-woman pair block a matching if they prefer being integrally matched with each other compared to their fractional arrangements. Okay, So in the matching on the left, uh, it's not stable. Why? Because there is a pair M2, W2, who both prefer each other or derive greater utility in being matched with each other compared to what they do under the fractional matching. Let's look at another example. So this time we are putting a weight of one on the top edge and a weight of half on the dashed edges below. And it's easy to see that this matching is indeed stable. In particular, uh, W2 now meets the ut utility threshold for, for the pair into W2. Okay, uh, I want to take a very brief uh, digression. So some of you might be familiar with a different formulation of stability in the context of fractional matching. I'm just going to call it ordinal stability for convenience. Uh, this notion uh, happens to coincide with the notion that I just described, which I'm going to call cardinal stability, when the matchings are integral. Okay, so for an integral matching, ordinal stability means the same thing as cardinal stability. But if we allow for fractional matchings, these two notions become incomparable in the sense that they could exist fractional matchings that satisfy one notion but not the other. Let me also note that this cardinal notion of stability that we're going to be working with, this is not our contribution. It has been defined before, uh, and it has been extensively studied in the economics literature. But I guess what is new to our work is some of the computational questions that I'm going to describe shortly. Okay, so enough with the background. Let's get into some observations. So the first observation is an easy one. A stable fractional matching always exists, okay? And uh, this is very easy to see because a stable integral matching is a special case of a, of a stable fractional matching. And so uh, we get the existence result for free times to gain in shape. The second observation is perhaps more interesting. It says that stable fractional matchings enjoy a welfare advantage compared to stable integral matchings. So specifically there exists an instance where the welfare of a stable fractional matching can be greater than the welfare of any of the integral stable matches. And to see an example, consider the instance shown here. This instance has uh, three factorial or six integral stable matchings, uh, integral, integral matching, sorry, and only two of those matchings are stable, okay? And the welfare of the stable matching is seven. So welfare in this case is just the sum of individual utilities. However, it turns out that the matching that we just saw a couple of slides ago, uh, the fractional matching, it tends to have welfare of 7.5. So 
So the welfare of the fractional stable matching is strictly greater than any of the integral stable matchings. And it's easy to see that we can make this arbitrarily bad. We can make the welfare gap as big as we want just by creating copies of this instance. Another observation is that uh, the support of a stable fractional matching can be unstable. So what do I mean by that? Uh, note that uh, fractional matching, thanks to the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem, we can think of a fractional matching as a convex combination of integral matchings. In other words, we can think of a fractional matching as a probability distribution over integral matchings. Okay, so every integral matching in the, in the support, uh, it is possible that, uh, it is possible that the support of a stable fractional matching consists of some unstable element. Okay, and in fact, this is true for uh, the example that I just showed you. So uh, the matching that we just saw, it has a unique decomposition in terms of integral matchings. And you can see that one of the matchings is unstable. Okay, and intuitively this is uh, the reason why stable fractional matchings can have a higher welfare. It's because we can have unstable matchings in the support, unstable matchings which have a lot higher welfare than the stable matchings. And that's how we are able to gain an edge over integral stable margins. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Can yes. I, uh, I sort of I'm confused about the definition of stability. Like, um, okay. you can have higher welfare even if you have you're instable. Could you just please go over that a little bit? What's the yeah. instability definition here in the fractional setting? So, so the higher welfare is because of the fractional nature. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the, I, I showed you that uh, the integral stable matchings, in this case, there's only two integral stable matchings and they each have a welfare of seven, but it turns out that there is a fractional matching, which is stable according to the cardinal definition that I presented a couple of slides ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That fractional matching can have a higher welfare than any of the integral stable matchings. So it is instable in the other way, like uh, it's in, it's stable in the odd, uh, cardinal setting, but it's not stable in the ordinal setting. That's what yes, you're... yes, uh, it is stable in the cardinal setting, but it could be that some matching in its Birkhoff or Neumann support yeah. is not stable. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. and you. that's that's intuitively why we are able to gain a welfare advantage. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you can make this uh, arbitrarily bad again. So there exist instances where a stable fractional matching has a purely unstable support. So in every decomposition, every single integral matching in its support could be unstable. Okay. All right. So I want to focus on the second observation here, which says that uh, stable fractional matchings have a welfare advantage over their integral counterparts. Uh, this observation motivates a very natural computational question. It's saying that, look, there is a fractional matching with a higher welfare. Now, can we find such solutions? Okay. So more specifically, given an instance with cardinal preferences, does there exist a stable fractional matching with at least a certain amount of welfare? Okay, so that's the main computational question that we're going to think about. And it turns out that the answer to this question depends uh, quite intricately on the preferences. So if the preferences are quote unquote simple in, in the sense that if we allow for binary valuations or zero one valuations, then in polynomial time, we can find an optimal stable integral, optimal stable fractional matching, okay? However, if we slightly expand ourselves uh, towards a broader valuation class. So if we allow for ternary valuations, meaning the valuations can take the values zero, one, and some number C bigger than one, then the picture becomes uh, a lot more interesting. So uh, it turns out that approximating the welfare to within a factor of one over C minus half now becomes empty hard okay? This is a very, a uh, very strong negative result. It's saying that just by moving to a slightly broader class, not only does the problem becomes hard to solve exactly, but it even becomes hard to approximate it. And uh, on, on the positive side, we can 
approximate the welfare up to a factor of half or one over C, whichever is less. Okay, so just to instantiate this result, suppose we allow for the valuations to take the values zero, one or two, okay? Then this result says that we can get 50% approximation in poly time, but doing anything better than 66% could be hard. Okay. Uh, in the paper, we also have uh, an approximation algorithm that works for general evaluations that does not make this ternary assumption. Uh, and the approximation factor there depends on the maximum and minimum non-zero values. Okay, so these results that I just described, they are for the exact version of stability. We are also thinking about the approximate notion of stability. So we are going to say that the matching is epsilon stable if the utility thresholds are just scaled down by a factor of one minus epsilon, okay? Uh, and in this case, we have matching upper and lower bounds. So uh, it is possible to get an epsilon approximation to the welfare in poly time. And I should note that the epsilon approximation here is with respect to the larger class of epsilon stable matches, okay? So we can get epsilon approximation efficiently and doing any better is again, computationally hard. Okay, so uh, so the, the hardness results are I think the technically most interesting part of the paper, but uh, they are quite involved. So I won't inflict any NP hardness reductions upon you. Uh, what I would get into is uh, the algorithmic results. So let's start with binary evaluations. Uh, so the algorithm for binary evaluations is very simple. We are going to start with a welfare maximizing matching. Okay. So, a welfare maximizing matching is going to be integral without loss of generality, but it may not be stable. It could have blocking pairs. Uh, what is worth noting is that any blocking pair in such a matching must be along a one, one edge. Okay, so if you look at the picture, uh, say M1 and W2 are the agents that form a blocking pair, then their utilities must be zero because it's an integral matching and because, of, because we have binary valuations and they must value each other at one and one. And say M1 uh, is matched to W1 in this matching and W2 is matched with uh, M2 and, and they, they value these agents at zero. Now, because the valuations are binary and because we have an optimal matching at hand, it turns out that we can fill in these question marks, these missing valuations. In fact, there is a unique way to fill in these entries uh, because of optimality of the matching. So any blocking pair must look like what is shown here on the screen. Okay, and now the algorithm is very simple. Whenever we see a blocking pair, we just do a toggle operation. We just swap the edges, okay? Uh, note that doing so does not change the welfare. So the welfare on the left was zero plus one plus zero plus one, which is two. And the welfare on the right is also two. Uh, more importantly though, whenever we do such an operation, we use up a one one edge and we never free up any one one edge, okay? And because there are only so many one one edges, the algorithm must terminate in n squared steps. Here n is the number of men or women, okay? So it's a very simple algorithm. All right, let me also talk about the algorithm for epsilon stability, which is also very simple. Uh, so in this case, again, we are going to start with a welfare maximizing matching, okay? But in addition, we're also going to start with uh, any integral stable matching, say returned by the gale shapely algorithm. Okay, so we have two matchings. One is stable and the other is optimal, but may not be stable. Uh, and the algorithm is just one line. We just take this convex combination of the two matchings. Okay. Now, uh, it's easy to see why this is an epsilon approximation. It's just because uh, the utilities are linear and so is the welfare and uh, because we are putting an epsilon mass on the optimal matching, we get the welfare approximation. And it's also easy to see why this is epsilon stable. It's because we are putting enough mass on the stable matching. And so we get the uh, threshold guarantee that we talked about earlier. Okay, uh, this is all I had to say regarding the technical part. Let me just recap uh, what we saw. So we saw uh, some structural aspects of uh, stable fractional matchings in the cardinal model. We saw that uh, fractional, stable fractional matchings uh, give a large welfare advantage, uh, but there's also a conflict between an ex ante and ex post notion uh, in the sense that the support can have unstable elements. 
the computational picture is also very interesting. So uh, finding an optimal stable matching is poly time for simple valuations or for approximate stability. But the problem becomes a lot harder when we move to a broader class of valuations. Uh, there are quite a few directions for future research that I'm excited about. So uh, we talked about stability as the solution concept, but one could think of either weakening it or strengthening it, okay? So uh, in terms of weakening it, one could think of computing an optimal popular fractional matching uh, when the preferences are cardinal. So uh, some of you might remember there was a talk in this very seminar series by Agnes, and she talked about popular integral matching, uh, but I think popular fractional solutions also make a lot of sense. Uh, we can also strengthen stability so note that the definition that I presented, this allows blocking pairs where, uh, where the men and women can deviate to an integral uh, alliance, okay? What if we allow for correlations of larger sizes? And on top of that, what if we, uh, sorry, what if we disallow correlations of uh, larger sizes? And uh, what if we also disallow the correlation from it just improving the fractional mass on the shared edges? Uh, I think that would also, it's, it's very much like the core notion. And I think it's, it's also very interesting to study. Uh, another direction is to think about uh, more general graphs. So, so far we have been looking at bipartite graphs, but what about the non-bipartite problem or the roommates model? Uh, in this case, it would be interesting to compute a stable mixed matching. So a mixed matching is just a distribution over integral margins, okay? Uh, I know that I'm emphasizing the word mixed because uh, for general graphs, being fractional is not a guarantee of being mixed because you also need the odd set constraints. Uh, finally, I think it would be interesting to also think about the incomplete information setting. So I presented some tractability results to you. Now the question is, can these results also work in a limited cardinal information setup? Do I really need to know all the numerical values in order to compute stable outcomes or can I do with less? Uh, similar questions have been uh, mentioned in, again, previous talks in this seminar, mostly in the context of distortion, but I think they also make a lot of sense in, in this matching setup. Okay, uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hoyt. So we, we can, uh, we can uh, actually unmute and... Okay. Uh, so um, most questions uh, asked during the talk have been answered, except the last two ones that have just come. Uh, uh, there, so, uh, Rohit, can, can you see there is yes, a, I, a question, I, I question, question from Francois? Okay. Uh, what is the rationale of the stability notion you consider? For example, if left equals freelance workers and right equals employers for some given tasks, then the natural notion of blocking pair I see would be if I prefers J to J prime, and if J prefers I to I prime, if I has a positive share with J prime and J with I prime, then I and J want to reduce uh, their respective shares with those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, this is a very natural uh, suggestion. And in fact, this definition has been considered in the literature. Uh, it, so this notion is known as strong stability. It has been considered in a paper by Ross, Ross Plum and uh, Van de Waite. Uh, and it turns out that that strong stability is stronger than the definition that I presented. Okay, so it implies the cardinal notion of stability. Um, the downside is that it's too restrictive because uh, the welfare for such strongly stable matchings could be much lower compared to cardinally stable matchings. So it's a very natural notion of stability, but uh, maybe welfare wise not as good. Yeah. Okay, uh, Omang is asking, is it possible to efficiently find a fractional stable matching that beats the best integral stable matching? Uh, I guess beats means welfare-wise. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just welfare. -based. Okay, okay. So, um, I mean, for the simple settings that I mentioned, yes. Uh, but for the general, like for example, ternary valuations, etc., it's not so clear to me. So, even finding something that does better than integral and at the same time is cardinally stable, I think is, is interesting. Yeah, good question.
Maybe it can uh, connect also to. The, oh, sorry, I mean, you still have a question. Yeah, move up the list. Uh, maybe, no, maybe also this question connects to a question by Nisak. Actually, that that okay. was already answered, but maybe you can comment on it. It's about the the worst okay. case uh, ratio worst between case. the is the the worst okay. case ratio between the, the social welfare of the the best uh, integral matching and the uh, the best uh, fractional matching and the social welfare of the best uh, integral matching. Yeah, yeah. So, so Nisarg, uh, that's a good question. So you're asking like a price of um, stability kind of a question. Uh, so the example that I showed you, right, where the fractional matching had a welfare of 7.5 and the integral matching had a welfare of seven, right? There, the ratio was already bigger than one, right? So if you're looking at like uh, multiplicative gaps, you can, you can make it quite big. And, and the values that I showed you were actually quite small. They were, they were like 0, 1, 2, and 3 in that example. But if you choose bigger numbers, you can make that ratio go big. OK. There was a question also by Yannick uh, about uh, the popular fractional matching problem. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how that would differ yeah. from the work of Kavita. Because I think she, saw, she showed yeah. that you can always find a uh, welfare optimizing two integral. Right, right, right. So, energy. so that notion of popularity is again in the ordinal setup, right? So we say that a matching is popular if it is not beaten by any other matching, and and the beaten relation is specified in terms of the ordinal preferences, right? So I'm asking a sim very similar question in the cardinal setup. So now, if agents' preferences are given by numbers, uh, can you can you do all those things again? So can you find an optimal popular fractional matching and and all sorts of Related questions. Okay, you have so a comment. The Sorry. Problem Any... would be that you can't easily yeah. put it into such nice, uh, such nice LP duality framework, right? I suspect so. Yeah, yeah. So the LP duality framework is very nice in the ordinal setup, but for cardinal, we might have to rethink some of those aspects. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bettina is asking. Oh, it's a comment. It could be a good idea to put the cardinal aspect uh, included in the notion of fractional stability into the title of the paper. Ah, OK. <laughs> it's a bit too late for that, but thank you for the comment. Uh, just to set it apart from the ordinal factors. OK, yeah, so thanks thanks for the comment. Um, Sanjukta is asking, the utility values you consider have ties? Yes, they do. In fact, uh, if you have, uh, say, binary or ternary valuations, and if you have many, many agents, of course, there will be ties, right? And uh, I think there is a follow paper to our work that shows that finding an optimal stable fractional matching is NP hard even when there are no ties. So even when the cardinal preferences are strict. Good question. Uh, Peter is asking so far. Uh, well, how, the question is yeah. how far you can get with linear programming methods, because it seems from the st structure of the problem that simply maximizing the welfare is an LP problem. Yes. So simply so, maximizing the welfare without worrying about stability is an LP problem, absolutely. Uh, if we also throw in stability into the mixture, right, then uh, it is like solving an exponential number of LPs. Why? Because uh, whenever I talk about a stable matching, for every pair, there is some carrier agent, right? Carrier agent is the one who meets the utility threshold for that pair, okay? So if I can make for every pair a guess who is the carrier, then I can write an LP to check whether there is a stable matching consistent with those guesses, okay? Uh, and because there are only n squared edges, I have to make two to the n squared guesses to cover the space of, you know, all the guesses. And one of those LPs will indeed give me an optimal stable fractional matching. So this is a very naive way of computing an optimal stable fractional matching. The, the downside is that it involves solving far too many LPs and uh, the hardness results that I presented, they show that, well, that, that might be sort of necessary. Uh, the problem and if is... you make it entirely one-sided, so you'll only look at maximizing from one side, it becomes entirely trivial because then you can use oh, greedy so methods. You mean, you mean a one-sided uh, matching setup, so agents and objects? Yes. Okay. Um, and in, this, in that case, you are... So what would be your notion of stability there? But there is no stability because you're only yeah, exactly. looking at one side and everybody grabs yeah. its optimal choice more or less. Yeah, then it's just a max weight matching computation. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm just curious if there are any questions that I might have No, uh, I believe that you answered all questions. You or your co-authors answered all <laughs> okay. questions. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy. If there are any other questions, happy to take them in the break or in the gallery session. 
So th th thank you very much for it. That was a very good thank talk. You. So I guess that now it's uh, break time. Yes, so, we're doing breakout rooms as usual uh, for 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so our second speaker is John Dickerson from the University of Maryland. John, please start. So you can see my slides? Yes. Yes. Perfect. So today I thought I would talk about something uh, a little bit new newer to me than some of the, the work that I typically tend to do in matching market design. So this will be on uh, competitive diffusion processes. Um, and this is joint work with a, a large team that we have uh, with some folks at MIT and uh, some folks at the University of Maryland. I'll just do shout outs to the students and postdocs in this author list. So Michael Curry, Marina Detel, and Adam Hesterberg are all computer scientists. And Aidan Malief is a, uh, I guess now senior PhD student in the political science department at MIT. Uh, and this is work that uh, has started appearing. So at AAAI 21 under the name Scalable Equilibrium Computation in Multi-Agent Influence Games on Networks. And then we have some ongoing work. Uh, I'll cover a couple of slides at the end of this talk. Uh, and so I'm gonna try to stick to uh, 20 or fewer minutes in this discussion. Great. So uh, we'll be talking about network influence today. So what is network influence? Uh, well, it's uh, motivated in part by this, this idea that people's opinions are strongly influenced by their friends' opinions. Okay, so if I were friends with uh, somebody and not friends with somebody else, then my opinion, well, my opinion would be influenced in some different way based on my, my friend, my, my affiliative uh, sort of relationship with another person. Okay. And so a goal of our work is uh, how can we behave, uh, uh, best exploit basically these sort of behavioral cascades that occur in say friendship networks or other social networks uh, uh, when we want to say spread a particular idea or a particular belief. Okay. So this cascade, and I'll give you a quick example and a couple of slides, but the cascading process is something like, well, if I have a belief, then my friend will start to share that belief and then that friend's friend will start to share that belief as well and so on. So there are uh, a variety of examples uh, uh, sort of on all sides of the karma spectrum for this sort of uh, modeling approach. Uh, you could be interested in promoting a new particular political view. You could be interested in promoting particular beliefs about say a public health crisis. You could be interested in uh, supporting or preventing a regime change uh, and so on. And some additional sort of bits of the model that we'll discuss today, uh, well, hey, maybe I have some budget, limited budget that I can use to influence people's internal or maybe even external beliefs, right? I can advertise to particular nodes, I can lobby in a particular way, I can, you know, drop leaflets on a country uh, if I'm, you know, decades ago and so on. Right? We might have other questions as well. For example, in a single agent version of this, uh, how would I spend my budget in such a way that I can say maximize a particular objective over the uh, limiting, uh, uh, diffusion process, or maybe if there's more than one agent, I might ask myself in the face of this adversarial sort of behavior, that agent has their own sort of uh, objective that they're trying to maximize, how would I allocate my budget on this network? Great. So that's sort of the high level goal here. Uh, just because of the time, I will also say that one motivating application uh, for this work is, is, is uh, uh, especially the multi-agent part of this, is, is understanding the sort of the diffusion of uh, information and misinformation in particularly uh, social networks on the internet when it comes to things like uh, public health messaging. Great. So network diffusion, obviously not a new thing. Uh, if we look at a single agent version of this, um, one thing I could do just to sort of push this point home is to visualize the spread of uh, influence in a network or beliefs in a network. Uh, over multiple time periods. So here we have a network, right? Every node could be a person, every node could be, uh, you know, a profile on the internet, whatever. And these edges might represent, let's say, uh, equal weight affiliative relationships between these people. So these two nodes here, the top left, they know each other, they have some strong relationship. These two are two hops away. And then over here on this side of the network, uh, maybe, maybe these people are many hops away from other nodes. Okay. So I'll, uh, do a quick animation here where I've colored some nodes based on some preset exogenous belief 
let, let's say that these six notes here share some belief, blue belief. They're, uh, I don't know, some piece of knowledge or, or they're interested in a particular pair of shoes or whatever. So time t equals zero, this is the sort of state of the network. And then many different models for this, but you can imagine iterating over multiple different time periods where these nodes that don't currently have this belief adopt that belief based on some process that's a function in part of their immediate network. So we can immediately see that the top right hand two black nodes are surrounded by nodes that already share the belief blue. And so maybe at time t equals one under some process, they'll adopt that belief. And now more nodes in this graph share this blue belief and that process will continue. So maybe these two nodes then adopt it. And now these two nodes then adopt it. And at time t equals four, well, this left-hand side of the graph is not exposed to much of that belief. They're only exposed via this one node here. And maybe under this process, these three black nodes or these two black nodes that are connected to that blue belief node uh, aren't ever going to adopt that belief. And so at this point, if I were to iterate forever, the, the graph would have reached a steady state. And, uh, and this is how it would end up. And so I can throw objective functions onto this from, say, my point of view. Let's say that I'm trying to, I get one point for every node that adopts my blue belief. In this case, I would have whatever it is, like 12 points, right? Cool. So again, this has been a studied idea for quite a long time. One very famous uh, model is, is due to De Groot in the, in the 70s, where we're going to associate some fractional belief xi with every node i. Okay. So here we have a node, uh, let's say 2, and it's going to have some belief 0.2 or 0.3 or 1. And then every node will start with some belief. I'll know this before I start the process. And at every time period, we're going to update a node's belief based on a weighted combination of its, uh, of its neighbors. Right? So here we're going to have some weight associated with every edge in the graph, uh, wij. Uh, is going to correspond to the uh, weight of the relationship between nodes i and j. Okay, so it's an undirected graph, and we're going to also assume that the weights uh, are normalized for every node. So the, the total sum of the weights going into each node is equal to 1. Okay. So here I'm just throwing some weights on some edges, and uh, this uh, uh, node, uh, uh, 1, is going to have the strongest relationship with 4, so weight is going to be 1 half, and then it's going to have equally sort of weaker relationships with 2 and 3, so their weights are going to be 1 fourth and 1 fourth. And now the update that we do it every time period is going to be, well, my node i, let's focus on, say, node 1 here, is going to update their internal belief based on a weighted combination of their, their immediate neighbors. Right. So here we'd take 1 fourth times 2 thirds plus 1 fourth times 1 third plus 1 half times 1, and we would get, hopefully this is right, 3 fourths. Great. So uh, folks have extended this sort of model. Here's one due to Friedkin and Johnson, where we capture internal beliefs on nodes as well. Okay, so nodes are going to express an external belief, and they're going to sort of harbor an internal belief. Okay, so the internal beliefs will use S for this. SI is going to live in uh, 0, 1. Uh, and then we're going to have external beliefs that are initially going to be equal to the internal beliefs, which I'll use Z for. Okay. So initially, uh, the S's and the Z's will be equal to each other. And then we'll do an update based now on both the internal belief, which we will assume uh, say won't change, and the external belief. So the internal belief uh, 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 is, is not going to change over time, and then the external beliefs will propagate and propagate and propagate, and we're interested in the limiting process of this as well. Great. Oh, I actually can't see chat right now. So if there are questions, uh, maybe one of the hosts can speak up uh, about that. Great. So here's the limiting, limiting, limiting impact of this as well. And so in this talk, we'll talk about ways to uh, influence uh, at the beginning of this process uh, beliefs such that we say uh, at the end of the day, maximize some objective over the final process. Great. So move along, move along, move along. And now we have single agent games of influence. And our question here is going to be, uh, well, hey, we have one agent and they're interested in spending some budget, like I motivated at the beginning of the, uh, of the talk. They're interested in spending some budget on the nodes in such a way that after they've spent that budget and after a diffusion process occurs, they maximize some so here's a network. Here are some internal beliefs for the five nodes in that network. And we might ask the question, hey, I'm given a budget, let's say two thirds. How do I allocate this in such a way over these different nodes such that after that diffusion process occurs, I say maximize the number of nodes that have adopted some belief. So they have some belief that they're expressing that's above some threshold, for example. Right. 
So when I allocate budget, I'm going to influence the internal belief of a node. In this particular model, I'm going to influence the internal belief in accordance with just well adding the budget that I applied to the node to the internal belief. So here we have an internal belief of two thirds, and I'm going to add one sixth to it, which gives me five sixths. Okay, so I just do this, fusion happens, and I get some points. Cool. And the objective for this model, and the objective for our model as well, is going to be to maximize some function over the expressed external beliefs at the end of the process. Okay? Because again, after I've allocated that budget, those internal beliefs are assumed not to change. Cool. So are there any questions so far before we hop into new stuff? I've sort of set the stage for new stuff. I, I, I don't see questions in the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe just a quick question. Uh, it, it's, I mean, allocating this uh, this budget. I mean, seems reminiscent a little bit of Colonel Bloto games. You you know, or in the yeah. yeah. In fact, that's some of the motivation. We talk about this a bit in the paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the, the co-authors on this, Mohammed Haji Gai, is like uh, very very into Bloto games. So for those who don't know Bloto games, you can motivate as, hey, we have a bunch of battlefields, and I have uh, say two players, um, or we have a bunch of political campaigns, and I have two players. And they're they're limited in budget, and they can they can apply budget to these battlefields. And if I have more budget than my opponent, I win. And if they have more budget than me, then they win. And our goal is to win the most battles subject to these budget constraints. Yeah. So this is almost like blotto games, where we also have sort of a network on the on the battlefields, if you will. Good. Thank you. Cool. So uh, we build on that single agent model by adding in more agents. There. Talk over. How do we do this? Uh, well, now instead of having one internal belief, one expressed belief, one SI, one ZI, we're going to have K internal and external beliefs for K playing. So we have to normalize a bit, and every node is going to have sort of a, a unit of belief that they spread across these K different players. So I could be Apple and Google, and we're both advertising for particular types of phones. And you know, maybe John is a big Apple lover, and so he has all of his unit of belief on the Apple team. Or maybe John's a big Android lover, and he has all his unit of belief on the on the Android team, or whatever. So the notation it gets a little bit heavier now, but it's exactly what you might expect. Remember, S refers to internal belief, and Z refers to external belief. And now we're going to have an internal belief for every node I and for every group K. And this will, again, live in 0, 1, and it will be normalized in such a way that every node has this unit of belief that's spread across all K players. So same graph as before, and now we just have more internal belief, right? So every node is assumed to have every, sorry, every edge is assumed to still have just the one weight. So it's not a weight with respect to a particular group. Could maybe actually extend the model that way, but for now it's not. And every internal belief for every node is going to, going to be spread across every, every player. Same with external beliefs, right? So I'm going to shout loudly to the Comstock seminar video series about my love of Apple or my love of, of Android or whatever. Okay. And initializing uh, every node's external belief to internal belief is exactly what we'll do again here as well. Okay. So a lot of different notations here, but it's exactly the, sort of the extension you would expect from the single agent slide that I had earlier. And the updates are going to be done independently for every opinion. So independently for k is equal to 1 and k is equal to 2 and so on, we'll have the external belief, again, be this sort of function of the internal beliefs of a node uh, plus a weighted sum of their neighbors expressed beliefs for every group and then normalized by, uh, sort of normalize it back down. Okay? And so we actually have a lemma in the paper saying that these, these external beliefs summed across every group stays below 1 throughout this entire process. And this is important. Uh, because we have this unit of belief that we want to sort of spread around uh, uh, each of the groups for each every node, and, and we don't want that to go above one. Cool. So a lot of notation again, but it's just the multi-agent version of that single agent process that I had before. Cool. So what's our game? Well, every agent is going to spend some budget on some nodes at the beginning of the day. That's going to influence the internal beliefs of the nodes, right? So we give every agent K a budget BK. Uh, let's say it's two for each of our two agents here. So this is a two-player game. They're going to allocate this budget to every node. So here we have a budget vector where agent one is allocating uh, one of their, so basically half of their budget to node one, and agent two is allocating only one third of their, uh, sorry, one sixth of their, their full budget to, to, to node one as well. And then we're going to update the internal beliefs of these nodes as a function of, well, their initial internal belief 
the amount that a group spends on them. And then we have to normalize by the total amount that all groups are spending on that node. Because again, we have this unit of belief for every node. And so we need to normalize it away. If I spend all my budget on a node uh, and you also spend all your budget on that node, uh, then we need to sort of normalize this back down, tamp this back down to the unit of belief. I can't spend you above your unit of belief, okay? Then our goal, just as before, is for every player k, they want to maximize some objective fk over the final expressed beliefs after a process, uh, sort of the, 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 the limiting zk here, right? So after the process is recovered. Cool. So uh, yeah, I guess stop me if you have questions on the model, but we, there are obviously many challenges here in, in sort of expressing uh, results in this model. So one is, is uh, the, the high dimensionality of the action space. Right? Like I, if I have a unit of budget as a player, I can spread that in, well, an infinite number of ways across different nodes. Uh, I also might, if I want to use, for example, an online learning algorithm to compute, say, equilibria for this, or uh, spoiler, equilibrium uh, for this, uh, then I might need to quickly compute things like a best response, right? And finally, it's not clear that there exists, well, I guess I just spoiled that, but it's not clear that there's a pure equilibrium. It's not clear that there's maybe a unique equilibrium in these settings, so I might have some sort of issues that arise from that. Cool. And so modeling decisions that one might make in a, in, a, in a situation like this, well, obviously the function that fk that every player k is trying to optimize, you know, if I can put constraints on that, I might have particular things that I can say. And so we're going to put some lightweight constraints on those, which will give us some nice theoretical results. So under some, I'm going to call them non-restrictive. I mean, they're, they're, they're restrictive in the sense that, you know, I am restricting away a family of functions here, but they're reasonably non-restrictive. Uh, conditions on this objective function fk for every player. Uh, and these non-restrictive conditions include, well, it's non-decreasing and it's convex in z, which is pretty natural. So it's basically if I pump, I don't know, if I pump more z into a particular player, if I give more expressed belief in Apple or in Google, then Apple or Google will get, you know, get some more points based on that. So it's, it's a pretty natural restriction, I would say. And the second restriction we're going to look at is that the game is constant sum. So uh, players are competing over finite resources here. They're competing over finite expressed belief. Okay, so uh, it's a constant sum game, and fk is going to be non-decreasing and convex in c. Then there exists a pure Nash equilibrium, which is awesome. And it's unique, which is also awesome. Uh, and if agents use no regret learning dynamics here, they're going to converge to that unique pure Nash equilibrium. And if this function is linear, which is to say, well, that's exactly what you'd expect if I, you know, pump up z for a particular player, then their objective is going to rise by some linear function of that z that I've pumped up. Then that equilibrium can be found using convex programming, which is great. So that's the scalable in the title for this talk. And I'll show you some results on you know, reasonably sized graphs that actually implement this method. Okay. So in the two-player case, assuming the game is constant sum, which is not, I would say, too restrictive, and in this case, assuming we have this linear fk, for every player k, we have a linear function of the expressed beliefs that give us points. Then, two players, we can assume that p1 is maximizing, p2 is minimizing, right? Constant sum game, you know, lean on your favorite minimax sort of results here. And we can formulate this as a saddle point problem. Okay. So one player is trying to maximize its own utility, and the other player is trying to minimize its opponent, because it's constant sum. Well, what am I looking at here? Well, here we have c is just the vector representation of my linear payoff function. Okay, so c is the coefficients that I place in front of the expressed beliefs for every player. So this should be fk, not just f. A is going to be an influence matrix. So I'm not going to go into this in depth in the talk, but uh, you can look at this reference or the paper, which again appeared at AAA 21, uh, AAA like last month or whatever. And they show basically how to construct an influence matrix that every element ij in that influence matrix. Uh, uh, sort of shows the, the, the impact that the internal belief of SI has on the final limiting ZJ. Okay. And uh, it's not hard to compute this. It's a, it's a graph Laplacian. You just take the inverse of it, and, uh, and, and, um, and they show in this paper that that actually sort of has this relationship, every element there, that every element uh, AIJ in this, this, this influence matrix, matrix A shows the influence of I's internal belief on the final expressed belief of J. So we show in the paper that the objective here is convex in P2's budget and concave in P1's budget, which means that we can just use uh, sort of exponentiated gradient descent to solve the problem, which is cool. 
So this is from like a from like an optimization point of view. This is this is not new stuff. This is just like a standard sort of saddle point problem. It's just we can solve it because we show that things are concave and convex in the right ways. Great. Okay, so that's just for the two-player case, and that's assuming we have a linear objective function here. Now that's nice though because we can now solve uh, solve these 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 competitive multiplayer well, two-player games in this case uh, using uh, sort of standard techniques like mirrors. I'm going to show a couple of quick experimental results, and then and then we can maybe hop to questions. So these experimental results get a little funky to look at. So here's a quick primer on, on, on how you read them. All right. So here's for two players. We have a blue player. We have a red player. Let's just focus on the blue player for now. Here I'm showing maybe a 44,000 node graph, and I'll I'll tell you where that number comes from in, in the future. Uh, and I've sorted this 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 graph. I've sorted the sort of the the 44,000 nodes by a uh, by the second eigenvector of a normalized adjacency matrix. And, and, and in some sense, this is going to reflect the graph structure. So those nodes on the left maybe will be uh, uh, less, less connected to the graph than, say, the nodes on the right. Sorry, more connected. Uh, to, more in general connected than the nodes on the right. Okay, and then uh, the zero line here is sort of the the uniform distribution of the budget for the blue player across all forty four thousand nodes. So this would be one over forty four thousand of my budget applied to every node. And then if a, a node is above that, I've uh, allocated additional budget over the one over n. And if a node is below that, I've allocated less budget than one over n. Okay, so here for this particular uh, pick particular node here, uh, blue has say allocated 15% or so less budget than, than uniform. And for this node, it's about 15% or so more budget than uniform. And finally, the little colors on some of these nodes represent, well, some nodes start with internal belief toward red, some nodes start with internal belief toward blue, and some don't start with really an, uh, uh, an opinion toward either player. Okay. So there are a lot of moving parts here, and then we can show this for red as well. So red uh, could allocate less or could allocate more to a particular node. So we start by looking at random graphs. So in the paper, we look at a couple families of random graphs. You know, pick your favorite families of random graphs. Here are some results. I'm not cherry picking. They all kind of look like this uh, for a particular parameterization of random graphs, where I've also given blue and red different budgets. So blue here is a bit weaker in terms of budget than red. Okay. And I've started by randomly assigning some vertices to believe in blue. 10% of them really believe in blue. 10% of them really believe in red. And the other 80% are sort of neutral. So first off, we can look at convergence of our uh, cool. Thanks, thanks. Uh, we can look at convergence of our of, of our optimization approach, and, and things converge very quickly. And second off, we can look at some graphs like I just showed you. Here we only have a thousand nodes, so I've sorted them again by the second eigenvector of the adjacency matrix, and we see a couple of things, right? And these are actually results that we're going to see on real-world networks as well, very very quickly because I only have two minutes left. Um, they basically say you should advertise to your enemy. So here blue is on top, red is on the bottom, and we see that blue is advertising a substantially higher amount toward nodes that start with an internal belief toward red, and that there's some reflection of the graph structure on the way that we allocate this budget as well. And uh, blue here again has sort of a, a, a less, less, uh, less, is less wealthy. They only have 10% of, uh, they have 100 budget total, whereas red has 500 budget total. And this influences the amounts uh, relative amount that is placed on these these enemy nodes as well. Now that's for random graphs. You can imagine doing this kind of thing on real world graphs as well. There's a really interesting data set covering a substantial like double digits portion of uh, citizens in Yemen uh, for a couple of years uh, uh, that we have access to. And this is 21 billion records covering the activity of about 6 million subscribers in Yemen. And I, I think that's something like 20 to 30 percent of the country. So it's a reasonable uh, it's a reasonable coverage of the country. Uh, and uh, these CDRs can be used to basically form a, form, form, form a graph. It's a dynamic graph that changes over time where an edge exists if I have called you. So we have unique identifiers, anonymized, but they're unique and they last over time, covering people who can call each other. So via metadata, you can form a graph around this. And so these are results for a particular subset of that graph in a, in a conflict region in, in Yemen in uh, the 2010 to 2012. Uh, a timeline, uh, and we can talk about this offline. This actually isn't in the AAAI paper, but we can talk about some of this this, this, this work offline that we're working on now. Um, and we might ask, hey, in a real world network where we've taken a snapshot over a number of weeks of 44,000 nodes, what does it look like if we have two players here uh, 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 advertising, for example, uh, to this, this network that has, say, real structure? And it's a very similar sort of uh, uh, results, qualitative results that we saw to these random graphs as well. So the advertised to your, to your enemies approach still holds here in this sort of real world looking graph. So in the interest of time, I'll just skip through this. Uh, 
So we do have some initial takeaways. So if you have a small amount of budget, uh, focusing on nodes that are sort of extremely against you seems to make sense. And as you get more and more budget, then you can spend more and more of that budget relatively on gray nodes. So these are neutral nodes. We played around a little bit with adding weights to particular nodes, like I might have higher value for converting a particular node. And this actually influences the uh, budget allocation a little bit, but the qualitative results remain. Interestingly, even without considering some of this fancy optimization, it looks like just sorting by the second eigenvector actually gives you a pretty good heuristic for applying budget to, uh, to these nodes prior to the diffusion process. Uh, and we can play around with the budgets as well in the weak and strong groups. It turns out if you have high sort of disparity between the budgets and the groups, then this will influence the way that the, uh, the budget gets allocated. And so before I get kicked off stage, because I've gone over a little bit, uh, some interesting further research direction. So while we do show the existence of the pure Nash equilibrium for more than two players, we don't have a really good uh, approach to uh, uh, practically solving these problems for more than two players. So I think that's a really interesting uh, line of research. So can a mirror descent based approach basically go forward for more than two players? Cool. So I'll leave it at that. And these are co-authors. Uh, Adam is not just a blue box in real life. I just didn't have a picture when I put these slides. Together. So thank you. Thank you, John. So, okay, so you have in the chat, you have uh, one comment by Peter. It's more a comment than a question. And then a comment or a question by uh, Sanjukta. So maybe if you can see. That's a comment about the last talk. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. I know. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. okay. So, uh, um, so yeah, Peter, I think it's more a comment, but you, you, want, you may want to, to comment on that. And, yes, and, I think uh, if, if it's an attempt to simplify a model by having the people um, having a full set of beliefs summing up to one by adding a non-belief, basically made, then you have your belief represented by a simplex of one dimension lower than others. Right. Otherwise, but um, do I understand correctly that your model of the budgeting is that you um, the amount of budget you're spending is equal to the degree of your candidate, your or the agent you're spending it on is willing to take your belief. Um, do you mind repeating that question? So you're, you're asking basically here, I'll, I'll pull up the, the if I spent one half of my budget on a particular agent, does that mean that he will assign the weight to this edge as far as belief transfer is going on equal to this one half you have spent it? No, no. So the, the weights on the edges are actually set. We're not ad adjusting the weights on the edges at all. So if you and I are close friends, then we'll have a weight of one and nothing will, will influence that. What we're doing is a node, for example, John has internal belief, call me you know, SI, I'm SI, my internal belief is SI for a particular group. And if I allocate, if that group allocates some budget to me, I'm going to update John's internal belief based on that budget. But I also need to update it based on the belief that other players are allocating to John as well. So we end up doing this normalization step as well. So here we're going to iterate over all, let's say, two groups so John and Peter. And if Peter were to apply additional budget to John, then John's internal belief toward well, it's just internal belief toward the other group would actually be lower. So we would normalize that away as well, right? So look at the numerator here. I have internal belief. If I add budget from a particular player to that node, then I will increase my internal belief. And then based on what other players are allocating that same node, we'll then tamp that down based on how much they're allocating as well. So there is nothing in the model looking like a saturation. If you're spending more and more budget other than by the normalization, um, the impact will decrease. Oh, uh, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, so we right. could also apply some concave function on the budgets. That's exactly right. Expressing yeah, yeah. saturation there. That's exactly. I actually don't. I don't have good intuition as to what that would do. Uh, do I have good? I, I'm. Not, um, that might change some of this. So some of the convexity and concavity that we're we're able to to leverage for this saddle point optimization for the specific case of linear functions for objective functions and two players that might actually drop the concavity uh, uh, and, uh, and, and 
convexity results there. But I, I think that is an interesting idea because nothing says that this is the right way to update the internal belief based on budget. I mean, some of this is like, it's nice modeling, right? It gives us the, the ability to prove some of these results. So yeah, that's exactly, um, that's a great idea. You, okay, thanks. You have a question by Reshef in the chat. All right, Reshef says, question, is this common also in Blotto games where in equilibrium the players invest in disjoint fields, specifically the fields where they have a disadvantage? So you're saying the qualitative, Reshef, you're saying the qualitative results that we have here? Um, yeah, I, I'm asking. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in Blotto equilibrium, but I, I don't remember any such qualitative result. Um, in the traditional Blotto game, I mean, Aren't all fields disjoint? I don't think there is network structure in the traditional Blotto game. So in some no, 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 I mean, yeah, but the, the in equi I mean, disjoint, the, the, in the, equi the equilibrium strategies are disjoint. Right? They, they invest essentially in different fields, right? Because oh, this I see. happens in your game, right? They, uh, they almost never invest in, in the same nodes. Right. So if, and I, I didn't go into the experimental results too much. So if uh, there are uh, fewer nodes that begin sort of believing strongly in each of the players, then there's more competition over nodes. So if you look at based on graph structure, if there's say mostly gray nodes, I'll call them gray instead of red or blue. So red believes in red and blue believes in blue and mostly gray, then you'll actually see the two players competing over the gray nodes that are hyper-connected, like have that based on graph structure that are very connected to the rest of the graph. So there is competition there that just wasn't evident in the experimental results that I showed. In Blotto games, uh, a big part actually of the equilibrium strategies comes down to the heterogeneity between the budgets of the players. So if the budgets have uh, highly, highly uh, 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 sort of similar budgets, then you're, you're actually gonna see competition over the battlefields as well. Um, and I'm not an expert in Blotto games either, but, but um, uh, we've done some experiments without sort of network structure, which becomes a blotto game in this model. And, and that, 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 that's what popped out. Okay, so I think there are no more questions. So thank you again, John. And uh, I have two things to say. And uh, the first thing is that uh, after the seminar, there will be for those who, who like uh, a social gathering on Gather Town. Uh, Reshef will send the link in the chat, right? Uh, you're doing that, Reshef? And, uh, and then uh, before we go to Gather Town, uh, Bill will announce the next uh, Comstock seminar. Okay, so our next seminar uh, is in two weeks. Um, uh, the, the speakers will be Felix Brandt, who will speak on a natural adaptive process for collaborative decision making, and Klaus Nehring on the median rule in judgment aggregation, extensions to weighted judgment contexts. This will be at the regular time on Thursday, but there's a real question as to what regular time means since uh, the clocks change at different rates in different parts of the world. And in particular, in New York, where I am, the clocks will have advanced an hour um, by the next seminar and in Paris, which is what we're using as our um, uh, kind of focal point, they will not. So uh, in other words, in particular, it'll start at 10 a.m. in New York rather than nine. And uh, it's up to you individuals to check when it's gonna start where you are, but uh, keep in mind that there is a countdown clock on the website. So if in doubt, you can always see how many actual hours there are between this moment and the, and the next talk. Uh, after that session, we will be switching to Fridays. So this next meeting two weeks from now is the last one to be on a Thursday for a while. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so see you on Gather Town. Bye-bye. Okay, you're welcome to join uh, using the link. Uh, I apologize that uh, the free version only allows 25 people, so... Uh, uh, if you're already, if it tells you that it's full, then uh, next time. And if it's successful, then we can extend it to more people, okay? Next time. <laughs>